Hello, everybody. My name is India, and welcome to the Homecoming Protecting Your Peace. When you're at home for the holidays, feel free to share your name, university, and what you're studying in the chat. And I go to Xavier University of Louisiana, and I study psychology, and I am a junior. And this panel, this panel is brought to you by the Steve Fund in partnership with the United Negro College Fund. The Steve Fund is the nation's leading organization focused on supporting mental health and emotion, emotional well-being for young people of color. The United Negro College Fund Institute for Capacity Building built upon its heritage of supporting Black colleges and their they have partnered with HBCUs to center mental health for their students, faculty, and administration through workshops, seminars, conferences, and virtual resources. Thank you for, jo for joining today's panel discussion where we will share valuable information with coping skills and to help you navigate the challenges when you go back home. And as we begin our discussion today, please feel free to share any stresses or challenges that you think that you may face when going home for the holidays in the Zoom chat. We would love to hear from you. And we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by Dr. Laura Robinson and Dr. Ray Lundy. Please introduce yourselves and share something you look forward to during the holiday season. All right, I'll start us off. Thank you, India. Welcome, everyone. So happy that you're here. I am Laura Robinson. I am the music therapy coordinator at um, Howard University, and I use pronouns of she, her. And my most favorite thing to look forward to the holidays, my birthday and the holidays are kind of close. So I kind of get to double dip a little bit. Um, but I really, really look forward to some really good home cooking over several days um don't get to do that a lot during during the school year so it's really nice to kind of be fed and just to be around the table with a bunch of my cousins and aunts and uncles hi everybody um, my name is dr ray lundy and i serve as um, the director for counseling services at georgia state university um, i'm a licensed psychologist my pronouns are she her hers and one of the things I love about the holidays is getting the opportunity to um, play games with um, some of my cousins. So Uno, I'm not the best spades player. Um, so people like to say they'll revoke my black card. Um, but just having the opportunity to kind of um, let my proverbial hair down, since my hair is kind of short, but um, just uh, be a little less on, so to speak. And I'm sure that's going to come up, come up in the conversation as well, just about how often the pressures we're experiencing in college um, are, are about just how much we have to perform or be on. And so um, going home and playing those games is a way that I kind of um, get a little relaxation in. Um, so glad for this conversation. Um, happy to be here with Dr. Robinson. And thanks, India, for leading us in the discussion. Thank y'all for sharing. And um, when is your birthday, Dr. Robinson? It's actually on Saturday. So oh. a little, little kickoff to the to the birthday festivities being with you all. Oh my goodness, mine is December 5th. That's why I'm like, I'm close. <laughs> well, um, thank y'all so much for sharing. And now it's time to get into our panel discussion. Um, so I'm gonna ask some questions and y'all feel free to answer however y'all like. So what are some examples of challenges you hear or see when students prepare to go home for the holidays? And why is it important to protect our peace? I can start. Um, so uh, some of the co common challenges that I see students experiencing are um, anxiety, anxiety being one of them. So anxiety in general is one of the um, most significant challenges that college students experience. And so as they prepare to go home, there can be a lot of uncertainty for some students. Um, so some students, while they may be excited about going, going home, they may or may not know, um, we'll give you a simple one, where they'll sleep. So when you were at home, you had a room 
right? And then maybe when you left, um, your younger brother, sister took over the room. So I, I have conversations with folks often feeling like, you know, I'm concerned I may not have privacy. I'm concerned I may get back again and my room is not there. Um, and so just really some angst around what to expect when they get home. Another, another um, topic that comes up a lot are financial concerns. Many of our students are doing work study or they are working a job in the city, but when they go home, they know they want to um, still be able to support themselves. So finding a seasonal job or not knowing um, if they'll be able to do that and be able to support themselves financially. Um, so financial concerns. A third thing that comes up often, and this is one where we have to do a lot of planning, um, is safety. Unfortunately, we think of, we tend to think of family as being a safe place, but that's not always the case for folks. So some folks have unfortunately experienced um, unwanted experiences such as sexual, sexual assault, domestic violence, um, with a partner who may be back at home. And so really um, finding the time as I'm working with students to help them come up with safety plans. And um, those are just kind of three of the things that stand out out from me. And as we'll get into later, what's really helpful with, with all of those things is to be able to talk about it openly, to talk about it early, and to plan and prepare as best we can. I would agree. Um, you kind of touched on some of the ones I had in mind, but I also would think and have heard from students that um, there's a little bit of an identity crisis that happens during this time because, you know, you you are identifying one way at school or on campus that you may not back at home. So when, you know, I was in school, I, you know, did not have the responsibility of the first child, the oldest, the only girl. I was just, you know, part of my, my friend group, my community, and I could just be that person. And so some students have expressed, you know, having to kind of almost code switch to go home, to go back to, you know, whatever identity that they are, are attached to by their family members, by their friends, by the town that they grew up in. Um, and then also being aware of just um, different triggers that come with, with being there that kind of speaks to the, some of the safety concerns, um, as well as just being aware that there might be, you know, some relational triggers that come up, you know, maybe you you and your mom get along really well because you're a couple states away and you don't have to engage with each other every day. And that pressure of having to reintegrate yourself into a life that continued after you left is really difficult. So I think from the family standpoint is how to reintegrate, how to reintegrate this person that's coming back into the flow that we've already created also. So I think it's just, again, finding your place, finding, um, you know, where you fit in and also what identity you're walking back into as you're returning home. Thank y'all for that. That was some great answers. Um, so the next question that we have is, in what ways can open and honest communication happen between college students and their families when addressing difficult topics during holiday gatherings? I, I need the answers for this. I think it's good to have these conversations in advance, way in advance. If you try to have these conversations on Christmas day, <laughs> that might be a little problematic. Having these conversations of, you know, what can I expect? Is there a plan for, you know, a specific holiday that you celebrate? Are you, um, you know, try to get a, a game plan of where you're going to be and, and who you're going to be around and who's going to be present um, just so that you can prepare yourself mentally and emotionally to be in those spaces and, um, yeah, I think that just having those conversations really will kind of take some of the pressure off if you go into those those situations kind of already heightened. I think it makes everything even more elevated. So um, I think having, you know, if you communicate, figure out how you communicate best. You communicate best via text or a voice memo or an email. It really just depends on, you know, your best way of communicating and also knowing the person that you're communicating with, how they best receive that information too. Um, you know, if I'm communicating with my grandfather, text may not be the best because he's a little bit slow to take in that information. But my brother, me, we could text all day and have a fine communication. So kind of knowing your best communication style, but also the person who's receiving it. So you can have that that conversation early. I love that. Um, just kind of still in what you said about me. So 
everything you said was all of what I was going to say. I will only add um, that um, if you know that your pattern of communication um, reduces when you're away from home. So what I mean by that is when I got to college, I used to talk to my mom when I was at home every day. Um, when I got to college, I didn't talk to her every day. So as I'm preparing to go home, as Dr. Robinson said, I want to think about um, that reintegration process and maybe start having the conversation early so you can create opportunities to develop that plan that she discussed. If you you know, go weeks without talking to your parents and you kind of just show up or your family and you just show up, then that might make those conversations hard. So as you're thinking about the next couple of days or weeks, send a text just every now and then or a little bit more frequently so that you're kind of, um, um, in addition to thinking ahead, you're, you're also kind of just re in, in, you know, kind of establishing your presence. Um, and it's normal for your cadence of communication to shift. But as you're going home, you do, again, want to kind of reinitiate and open up that dialogue. Um, and then, as she said, thinking about the mode of communication, thinking about is it text, is it FaceTime? Um, and the only other piece I'll add is there are perhaps people in your sphere that you're going home to that you feel safer with. So if you think about um, not only mode of communication, think about the person who maybe it feels safest to maybe initiate a conversation with. It might be your sister. Your sister might know how to talk to mom in a different way about some things. So once you've identified, well, who's my safe person? That allows you to then maybe even get some support in having a larger conversation with family if, if necessary. So um, reintegrate yourself a little bit, initiate those conversations, find your safe person. And as we both have said, make sure you know what's the best mode of communication. Um, oh, and I would also add, as best you can be direct. Sometimes we think people know what we're thinking and feeling. Um, and we assume because they are our family, they should just know. You know me. You've known me all my life. That may not be the case. And for many of us, if we were first generation college students, they may, you're, you're experiencing something perhaps that folks have never experienced. And so as best we can, having direct communication is important. Yeah, these are all really good points. I want to ask something to that. Um, so for people who are like really busy during like the school year and they feel like they don't have any time for anything um, and they happen to forget to communicate ahead of time, what would y'all suggest for people um, who get home and are like, oh snap, like now I got to say what I got to say and I don't know what to do. So you're thinking about my last suggestion where I said like, hey, try to have some of those conversations earlier on. That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that things happen, that, that timing is important, but to not, I would say if anyone is hearing that, to not feel pressure. Like you said, things get busy, India. So if you get home and you haven't had that conversation, I would then lean on the suggestion that I gave you around um, knowing your entry point or your safe person. So if you didn't have it beforehand, but you know you really can talk to your sister about anything, kind of have that conversation with your sister. Or if it's like you talk to dad differently than you talk to mom, maybe talk to dad and then see how um, dad can bring mom in. Finding that safe person, the entry point, I, I think is a way to kind of jumpstart the conversation because there's less angst around talking to that person and it may just flow more naturally. That's exactly Thank what I was going to say. So, perfect. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. So the next question that we have is, how can colleges and universities better support students with grief or challenging family situation, especially during the holiday breaks? Um, I think that being aware of what students are dealing with prior to leaving, I think a lot of a lot of these things are are preparation there prior to because if you have the tools before you have to be in a situation to actually use them, you're more equipped. You have time to practice, right? So I think having spaces where students can go and get support. Um, 
before they leave is an awesome, maybe even some sort of mentor or buddy system of like, okay, I know this is your first holiday home and maybe this is your first holiday home without someone significant in your life because you had a loss or maybe it's your first holiday home and you know you just are very anxious about it. Having a buddy system or a, a point of contact that can kind of touch base back in with on the board outside of their familial circle, I think would be an awesome, um, an awesome addition that provide point. Um, they can kind of identify who they eye on. I think that you, universities can really do having more structured spaces where students can kind of practice these skills we're talking to their families you know okay what you were going to text your mom and let's see how it reads is it reading anxious is it is it read so maybe that's not the best language to use maybe let's try to do this so this team helps support each other uh, would be an awesome resource um and even having just uh, counselors available over the breaks that students can maybe call into or touch base with would be an awesome addition as well because sometimes you just need that listening ear that's not attached to the situation to give you perspective. Dr. Robinson, I think we're losing you just a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can okay. Hear you. Cool. Even though we were losing you a little bit, those were some great suggestions. I love the idea or the the thought about um, identifying or universities, institutions having some counselors on call or available over the holidays in case students need support. I know um, at my current institution and previous institutions, um, the use of technology is really important. And so... Um, institutions investing in technology that will allow students to continue to have some ongoing dialogue. So for example, um, one of the things we hear, have here at GSU, it's called Together All, and it's a peer support network um, that is available 24-7 that students can register and then talk about their mental health concerns with other students across the nation. And in that app, um, uh, mental health kind of like buddies are there to respond in addition to any student who might want to respond. So if you're, if you write in the together all at that, Hey man, being at home is tough. Then you've just communicated with hundreds of thousands of other students across the nation who may also be experiencing that. And so that's us. Um, it is a service that we offer to our students and that's on our website. And we encourage students um, to uh, utilize and register for Together All. We also, also have another um, technology, um, kind of AI technology that we use and we make sure to promote this time of year for students um, who may be experiencing grief or concerns about going home, um, where it's, it's almost like a therapist in your pocket. So once you're registering for what we call Panther Strong, it will send you a notification each day to check in with you and say, hey, how are you doing today? Um, and then you get the opportunity to journal. So I think institutions investing in mental health technologies is really important because if the student can't physically be there, the, um, the technology kind of fills in that gap. And then I think the final thing I'll add is that institutions must to do a good job of communicating like availability, office hours, when things are closing, um, really important. Uh, like for example, I'm working with the website uh, manager for our counseling center around making sure that if you were to visit our counseling page, a pop-up says, hey, the physical office is closed starting this time to this time, but it will also then list those together all resources, the Panther Strong resources. So really um, making sure that we as an institution are communicating what resources are available. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, we haven't done that here, but I'm in the process. I really loved what I saw at one of our other Georgia institutions. They do, um, they have a page on their website that's called What to Do While You Wait. And it's a page that's devoted to students being able, who may be on the wait list and not be able to be seen at the counseling center. But What to Do While You Wait has a whole litany of mental health um, apps 
and worksheets and pay, it's a it's a page filled with um, self guided support. And so that's something I would say that institutions need to do a good job, a better job of just making sure that like if you don't have a physical person and the institution is closed, you still got to give people something. And so um, yeah. That's what I would say we need to continue to do um, if institutions aren't already doing that. Yeah, I really like that together all together. What was it called? Together, together all. Yeah, I love that. yeah. So that's something, India. If your institution, so if Xavier's in, or your huh, my alma mater, if we're interested, um, you'd want to talk. Uh, it's a so it's an investment by the institution. That's why it's definitely an institutional question because it's expensive. There's another one called Talk Campus that's also really popular and well received and um and institutions, not just historically black institutions, but institutions across the nation are using that one. So I would, you know, take those, if any student is here, if you're hearing something that seems meaningful for you, take this information back to your administration, back to your counseling centers, let them know, because this is the time of the year that we as directors are, or, you know, anyone in the center, we're writing grants, we're thinking about next year's budget, and to know that these are things you all might be receptive to, this gives us an opportunity to um, plead with the power that be uh, to provide this information and resource for you. Yeah, that that's a I love that. Um, I have one last question for y'all. What resources or coping strategies do you all recommend for college students who may be experiencing? Oh wait, I'm sorry. That was I think that was the last one. Yeah. Oh, we did it all. Great. Okay, so next. We have our Q&A session. Thank y'all for sharing your amazing insights with us. We love to open up our questions to the audience at this time. If you have any questions, please share that in the chat. Feel free to ask whatever y'all want. Don't be shy, y'all can ask any kind of question. So somebody asks, do you know of any resources for insecure housing? Oh, that's a good one. And I'm, I'm thinking back to that question around what are some of the concerns that come up for students? That's one that I didn't mention when I talked about safety, but like housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, perfect question. Um, and what, what I will say is this is another opportunity for folks to tap into their counseling centers. Um, I'm probably a little bit biased, but what we have here in our counseling center are what we call um, client advocates and their case management um, support services um, within our center. And what that person's role in the counseling center is to help students get connected with resources in their community. So I could name a resource, but I know we're from all across the country. And so what you really want to do is to be able to find local um local resources, um, but starting what I know that our client advocates tend to start with um, are um, um, church affiliated institutions, the um, Red Cross, things of that nature, folks who um, who traditionally are providing aid for folks. And then uh, those, those resources kind of expand out, but check with your on campus, even the Dean of Students Office. The Dean of Students Office is gonna have someone who is, it's their task to be to provide emergency aid. So you think about emergency aid, if someone has, has housing insecurity, that is an emergency for sure. So checking with your on-campus resources is a first suggestion I have. Did you have anything to add, Dr. Robinson? Okay, so somebody asked me, um, am I- quickly. I also I also wanted to encourage whoever may be um, struggling in looking for housing or housing insecure to also reach out to your residence life coordinator um, or your RA because there may be flexibility for you to stay on campus 
um, during the holiday break. And I know that there are professors and staff who often open up their homes to some students who may not be able to travel back home um, to allow to allow you to stay on campus, stay in your dorm or temporary um, on campus um, living situations. Thank you for adding that too. Um, so I was asked, am I excited about going home for the season and how do I protect my peace during the holiday season? Um, I'm excited to go back. I'm really, it's been a long semester. Like, oh my goodness. I'm almost done now. I'll be done on Monday. Then I'm going back home on like the 13th. But I'm excited to go back. I protect my peace by just staying in my room. You know, talking to my siblings sometimes, <laughs> but staying in my room mainly. I love to sleep a lot. I feel like that's another way to protect my peace because when I'm at school, I don't get much sleep. So when I'm at home, I can sleep. I can rejuvenate. I can play my games. I can talk to my friends for however long I want. So yeah, I'm very excited to go back home for the holidays. Um, but somebody else had a question too. Let me see if I can find it. Somebody asked, how can an older age student apply for grants? What kind of grants are, are you talking about specifically? If you don't mind, put that in the chat. In the meantime, in terms of grants, um, and financial aid questions, I would encourage any student um, to contact their local or their financial aid office um, to get some additional support and what grants and scholarships may be available. Some of them actually come um, at the spare of the moment. So the question was for personal and educational needs. Mm -hmm. So some grants or scholarships come in the middle of the semester or there may be emergency funding um, or um, sort of supports for clothing for those who can't afford maybe jackets or um, coats for the winter or food pantries. Um, student affairs and financial aid offices typically have some of the um, what I call best kept secrets uh, on campus. Thank you. So I have some more questions for y'all. For Dr. Robinson and Dr. Lundy. Um, what role do friends or chosen family play in supporting college students who may not have a positive family dynamics during the holiday season? <laughs> I mean, going at the same time. I think that having that um, kind of line out from where you are is really important um, to just kind of keep a sort of grounding and normalcy to your your everyday life, a connection to what has become your new norm. Um, have an outlet. You know, sometimes it's just nice to have someone to speak with or talk to that isn't directly related to you <laughs> or, you know, doesn't necessarily share the same um, issues that you do, just to have kind of a, a sounding board. And I think also having someone on the outside who knows um, this evolving version of you can kind of remind those, those things, right? Bring those to your remembrance when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling burnt out, when you're feeling, um, you know, unstable, they can just, you know, speak to, Hey, this is not you. I'm not, this is not someone that, you know, you don't give up that easily. And you're not, you're not, you know, in a place where you need to have a breakdown, like let's cry it out for a couple of minutes. And then they can just pour off all these affirmations and words of encouragement for you. So I think that, you know, staying in touch with your chosen family, your chosen circle, your friend group um, through that time really can kind of give you a little more grounding in spaces that may not be as um, comforting or you feel as, as stable in. And that was very well said. And um, an initial thought took me back to our previous question, which is sometimes your chosen family can help also with the housing insecurity. I have had students who have shared with me they don't have anywhere to go for the holidays. And then we work with one of their closest friends that they've established at school or chosen family. And they've been able to have a safe and um, and also a fun and a, a new experience over the holidays and a loving one. So your chosen family can come in and um, 
in the nick of time and support you there. Um, yeah, and I think everything else Dr. Robinson said was was spot on. Um, they give you, they remind you of what she's talked about earlier with, um, they remind you of your your budding and emerging identity. Your, your identity at school and your identity at, at home are two different, perhaps two different things, but staying connected to those friends gets to keep, help you to, to hold both at the same time. I'm a daughter, but I'm also um, a cheerleader. I'm a, so you get to hold both of those identities and, and staying connected, I think, helps you as you're further going through this process of um, identity formation, which is normal, which is natural. I guess I want to, we want to affirm for you that like having some of these mixed feelings, we want to normalize that um, because this is a part of the developmental process that happens when you're in college. So. All right, now I have one last question for you all. Um, how can we promote a more inclusive and understanding environment for college students with diverse family structures or backgrounds during holiday celebrations? I think we've got to do like whoever just wrote that question and call it out. <laughs> First and foremost, institutions, particularly our, our institutions, historically black institutions are steeped in culture. So when we think about culture, we talk about going home. We call this winter break, we are all often still calling it Christmas break, right? It's not Christmas break for everyone. Um, we're also still assuming that folks are going home to quote unquote traditional families. And so we, I would say as, a, as st students, challenge your administrators, challenge us to work on our language, right? We know now as we approach this meeting, we've come into today's meeting and, and we gave our, our, pro, our preferred pronouns. That's something that didn't always happen, but we had to be, um, we had to continue to grow and learn as institution, as administrators. So I would say one way we help institutions do a better job of expanding how they are approaching this is when you as student leaders are suggesting programs for the end of the semester. Make sure you call folks out when we are not being as inclusive as we could be to think about all of the different types of experiences. Making sure we're inclusive of Kwanzaa as a part of this experience and not just talking about Christmas. Uh, I think it takes all of us having a conversation and being able to be brave so making sure these are brave spaces where folks are speaking up and saying you know what i didn't feel included in that experience and next time if you know if my student development student engagement places are supposed to be for all students next time you need to include fill in the blank absolutely i love that uh facilitate brave spaces um i think that you know, HBCUs in general have a very strong, deep seated tie to tradition. And so whatever tradition they have leaned on just continues to just permeate. It's just the norm. That's just what we've always done. Um, but I know even speaking with my students, there is a desire for different, there's a desire for change. And so um, finding those brave spaces where you can just, hey, this is I'd like to see this happen instead, or, you know, they have, uh, maybe you're in part of an organization or a club that could start promoting these things as, as a new, a new norm. Um, I think those are, are really, really amazing. And I think also, um, encouraging your professors that have same similar values to also be a liaison for you and to speak on your behalf. Sometimes they need to hear it from, you know, someone with, you know, a little bit more of a title just to get things rolling, but there are professors that are in the same space. So encourage your, your mentors and your professors that are on campus to, you know, speak to those things. If you're, they're seeing things to call them out, to encourage their admins and, and the, their colleagues to be sensitive to not everyone is going home to a traditional celebration that everyone is going home, we'll start there, that everyone, um, you know, understands or, you know, feels the joy around this season for some people that I know, some of my students, this has been a really difficult couple of weeks with all the holidays back to back because of loss, because of insecurity of job, you know, job and housing insecurity, because there's trauma that they're going back to. So it's, 
been a lot of mixed bags. So I think just holding space as you see that happen and also for your, your friend groups, you know, if you see something happening, you know, hold space for that person. And even though you may not have a shared experience, empathy can go a long way. Um, so I think that, you know, just being, being sensitive to those around you, I think that will rub off on, you know, some of your professors and hopefully administration. I think that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, universities and colleges are really looking towards how to be more inclusive and how to be more understanding. And so I think that, that these you students that are in right now have a really beautiful, uh, cadence to be able to help help us move in that direction. Thank y'all so much for that. I just wanna see if y'all have any more final words that y'all wanna say to close out the Q&A session. Um, y'all have said great things so far. Y'all can add whatever y'all like. <laughs> y'all are good? Do you, you want us to kind of close out or share, kind of share closing thoughts? I know we, we're moving yeah. into some additional things um, and I'm super excited about the next part of our experience. Um, I'll just say that um, if home, or if this season is challenging for anyone who's watching, um, give yourself permission to take care of yourself in whatever way you need. The expectation may be, whether you've given yourself the expectation or your family has given it to you, that when you go home, you have to be around and be everything to everybody. But if you need to feel safe, you need if you need a moment to yourself, if you need privacy, if you need, give yourself permission to not have to talk and be around everybody if that's what you need. Um, and know that um, people like Dr. Robinson and I working in counseling centers on your institutions, that we are here to help you brainstorm and think about what are the best ways that you can engage in self-care if you're triggered when you go home or if you're not. And then if you're grieving, one of the things we didn't talk as much about, but this may be the first holiday without someone you love. If you are grieving, um, be gentle with yourself, compassionate with yourself as well. And know that um, there are resources around grief that you can reach out to about as well. So just be gentle, know that um, it's okay if it doesn't feel great because the, the holiday season, the songs, the the t commercials, everybody's telling you you're supposed to smile. And if you're not, that's okay. Pause and take the time you need to engage in whatever wellness practices, whether it's a walk, whether it's journaling, whether it's prayer meditation, connecting with your chosen family, give yourself permission to engage in those things. Um, because you're worthy and you're deserving. Thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who need to hear that. And um, before we close out today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Robinson lead us in a sound activity. So you can go ahead with that. All right. So um, as a board certified music therapist, I look to music to really um, kind of get me through a lot of things. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to do a um, progressive muscle relaxation, which is a music therapy technique. And so um, I'm going to explain it. So you gotta know kind of what we're doing, what to expect. And then I will demonstrate, I'll stay on camera and demonstrate and you all can do it along with me. That way, if you want to use this while you're at home, you kind of have an idea how to do it. So. With progressive muscle relaxation, we're going to focus on one area of the body at a time. Basically, we're going to tense up those muscles as much as we can and then release while doing some breathing. So the idea is, you know, if you carry your tension or you're stressing your shoulders, if you are carrying it in your neck, that's where I carry all mine right up in here. Once we hit that release, you can just kind of let it all go. And so I'm going to ask you guys to kind of focus in if there is something that is um, kind of worrying you 
or making you anxious about going home, focus on that thing in that part of your body that we're in. Um, And then when we release it, you're just going to breathe it out and let it go. Because right now we just need to get through finals. We need to focus in and we don't need to keep carrying that physically in our body. So um, the music that I'm, we're going to use just so you guys have it, if you want to use it later is called, uh, Lumia by Laom Moyen. Um, it's an instrumental. I choose to do instrumentals when I'm doing progressive muscle things and any type of relaxation because I will start singing along and get distracted. So it's, um, piano. And so we're going to, um, I'm just going to walk you guys through a couple minutes of it and, um, demonstrate. So I just want to encourage you guys, if you are seated to ground yourself, put your both feet flat on the floor. Um, if you'd like to lay down, if you'd like to, um, you know, get in a different position, this would be a great time to do that. And then, um, whenever our beautiful tech support is ready, we can go ahead and start something to, (laughs) something to just, you know, ground you. You're just grounding your emotions. You're trying to, you're regulating your heart rate. You are regulating your breathing. You can do something as, as simple as that. What was that? Five, almost five minutes. Um, if you find a song that just kind of speaks to you lyrically or, or instrumentally and just do those simple movements, you can go all the way down your body to your legs, to your toes. Um, but yeah, that's just a nice way to just kind of reground yourself before you go into a, a situation or a gathering or even before that drive home if that's that's how you get there so thank you guys for participating i really appreciate it thank you so much for that i love music and i love combining it with therapy i just i love music so much i'm classically trained and all that and i've learned about music and the fact that you're incorporating it into something so important i really do appreciate that and i'm sure you all enjoyed that um thank you for leading us in that um and thank y'all so much for joining and we hope y'all enjoyed today's panel discussion and gained valuable skills to help you navigate being home for the holidays wherever that may be and before you go please be sure to take our survey you'll find a qr code on the screen as well as a link in the chat so make sure y'all go do that And thank you so much. Be sure to follow Steve Fun on all their social media channels for any upcoming events, y'all. Have a great day and have a safe winter break. Thank y'all. Can we stop the recording, please? I think I can stop it. Let me see.